to begin today's show with a very simple question. Maybe you've thought of this and maybe you haven't. Here's the question. What is a man and what separates a man from simply someone who is male? <laughs> we look at males and we could talk about what it is to be biologically male. But what is it that makes a male a man? We have so many males running around in our country and people who are holding jobs. They're grown up, of course, but they're not truly, by a clear definition, a man. What does it mean to be a man? And then why does it matter? What impact does manhood have on our homes, with our children, with our spouses, in culture at large? Why is this an issue any of us should care about? Today on the March or Die show, I have uh, an incredible guest that we will discuss this issue with, and I hope that you will pay attention. At the end, we'll talk about how to connect to his ministry, but this is such a critical issue, particularly at this moment in time. We'll get to that in just a moment. Hello and welcome to the March or Die show today. Very glad to have you joining me and excited about the interview you are about to hear. Before we jump into that, though, I will remind you, if you're not yet subscribed to the podcast, please do subscribe. Very important that you subscribe right now. Don't wait. There are a lot of people who say, I will subscribe, and then don't. Don't wait. Do it right now. That would be fantastic. And then take some time. Go over to jeremystalnecker.com, Jeremy stallnecker.com. Uh, one of the issues that uh, I talk about often is this, uh, this issue or this idea of manhood. In fact, with the work that we do in the Mighty Oaks Foundation, we have two separate programs. We have a men's program and a women's program for veterans, active duty service members, and first responders. And I get asked the question all of the time, why do you separate those out? There are a lot of reasons, uh, logistics reasons, there are practical reasons, but fundamentally, we understand, and we've learned this over years of work, uh, we understand that when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about all of these issues that we address through our programs, really what we need to do to move forward is understand how to be the person God created us to be. And for men, that means being the men that God created us to be. When we understand what it is to be a man, when we define manhood, when we're able to be the man that God created us to be and all that is involved with that, the, the traumas, the trials, the difficulties of our past, those don't go away, but we are moving into what God created for us and created us to be and to do. And so those things that are there don't have a hold on us anymore. Likewise, <laughs> if you are a woman, understanding that God created you specifically with design and purpose. And if you can understand how to be the woman that God created you to be, the traumas, the trials, the difficulties of your past, they exist, but you're able to move forward in spite of them. That is the essence of biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. And yet, particularly as it relates to men in our society, in our culture, there is so much misunderstanding, and that's why I'm grateful to have on today as my guest, Jim Ramos. If you're not familiar with Jim, he is the founder and CEO of Men in the Arena, best-selling author, speaker, uh, runs a nonprofit Christian ministry focused on equipping men to honor God in the leadership of their family, church, and community, hosts a podcast, uh, has a huge digital presence or online presence, and speaks so clearly on this issue. I was grateful to be able to have him. We've scheduled this, or we scheduled this uh, some time ago, and uh, finally are able to share this conversation with you. I know this is one that you're going to appreciate. It will be, I believe, helpful. Share this content out with others, and go back and review it, and then check out Jim's uh, content for men in the arena. Without further ado, my interview with my guest today, Jim Ramos. Jim, thanks for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. Been looking forward to this for a long time. Man, I'm excited to be on your show. I'm really uh, connected with what you guys do and love the things I've read so far. The uh, the work that you are involved in really is, um, it, it's it's right in line with what we do. We talk often about, you know, what do you guys do with veterans and active duty service members and all of that. And, and you boil what we do down. It really is a men's ministry on our men's side. <laughs> we have a men's program. Um, I was just asked about this uh, the other day. What do you do with women, right? And, and I had to go through this explanation of we talk about 
trauma. We talk about all of these issues, but really what we talk about in our men's program is how to be the man God created you to be. And on the yeah. women's side, we talk about how to be the woman God created you to be, because if you're that, then the traumas, the trials, all the stuff in your background, it, it no longer has a hold on you. And so really that is the essence of what we do. So man, super stoked to uh, be able to spend a few minutes talking through this. Um, for those that don't know you, let's just start with with you, who you are, your background, and and kind of the catalyst for starting Men in the Arena. And for those that don't know, huge platform, huge ministry to men. Um, what got you here, and what was the catalyst for starting that? Yeah, you know it's interesting. So I <clears throat> I came to Christ through a football injury. I think the helmet right there. My I played at Santa Clara University. Uh, ended up coming to Christ through a series of injuries, and got called into had a had a miraculous event where I was overdosed by the anesthesiologist and I was code wow. went code blue. I was blind for three days in the hospital. I had no, I'd never heard from, of God or never heard him speak to me, but as a 19 year old, God called me into what ended up being youth ministry. Wow. So yeah. I uh, did uh, 20, about 25 years of youth ministry. <laughs> and after that time, uh, I thought I was kind of a lifer and, but I started getting unsettled. I started feeling like my impact for life was not being met and I was not living out my life verse of John 10, 10, you know, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Mm. And so after a reflection and prayer, I was in a coffee shop in uh, sisters, Oregon, and God used a coffee, a quote on a coffee cup to change my life uh, by a guy named St. Irenaeus in about 85 or 185 AD. He said, the glory of God is man fully alive. That led me into a series of questions that led me to realize God changed my calling to men. And so after doing some research and getting key advisors into my life and starting a probe type of ministry, we launched this ministry uh, with 15 guys in a coffee shop. And that was in 2012, went full time as a, you know, a missionary or nonprofit organization. You guys know the nonprofit world. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's been a battle. It's been a grind. You know, I'm a big believer and whoever said, you know, don't beat the dead horse definitely must have been an atheist because we have beaten the dead horse so many times and, and just till and bet until God resurrected it, you know. Yeah. And so uh, so uh, I realized uh, in that moment, in that coffee shop, though, that all of my issues in youth ministry and all of the things that really angered me revolved around men who were not there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't call them men. That would be an insult to men. I, I'm saying males, yeah. males who are unavailable and who are ruining uh, the, those around them because of their inavailability. And I thought, we need to come alongside and help men to grow in man manhood and to help males realize that they need to transition into uh, what a, a, ma a man. And so we've just given our life uh, to men. And uh, we uh, I, I'm a big fan of our military guys and our first responders. And actually... I don't know if you know this, Jeremy, but I, I, don't, I don't know how we're trying to partner with as many groups as we can. We've got an yeah. official partnership with Christian Peace Officers Association. We give our resources, digital resources free to active military, wow. uh, Leos, first responders. I mean, it's not we don't give the paperback, but we give a digital copy free. So our guys can just anybody who's involved there can come on in and. We just love our, our my last book right here, Strong Men, Dangerous Times. We literally mailed those out for free in blocks of wow. 10. We just love our military guys. And so we just because a lot of those guys, as you know, come back and they've yep. experienced trauma, a traumatic yep. life event, you know, real trauma. You know, not my mom and dad stopped paying for my cell phone when I was 25, <laughs> but real trauma. Right. And so they need help. Right. And I want to help those guys. And so, uh, yeah, so that's where we're at. We have about 255,000 different people in our weekly tribe last year, we reached over 21 million, 500,000 with our messages. Incredible. And so, but we're just really committed to helping men to become the guys that God has called them to be. That's incredible, man. What an amazing uh, story and amazing journey man, that long in youth ministry had to have done something to you. So I, I've done just about everything in ministry. Um, I haven't served in children's ministry. And for one year I worked with youth in a church and that was, Man, that was the most I could do. My wife loved those kids, and I, I, I loved them. I just had a hard time being around them. I couldn't do it. Um, that's a special ministry as well. Uh, talk to me uh, real, real quick, if you can, about you, you said you're working with youth, and you realized that most of the things that you were upset about, most of the, you know, the issues you were looking at were 
or really related to men or absent men or however you said that. Can, can you kind of drill down on that a little bit? What, what was it specifically that caused you to go, these issues are men's issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, you had several different types of fatherlessness. One of those types is the dad who is in the home. He is a, a, a involved in a nuclear family situation. Uh, you know, it's uh, the parents have been married the entire time. So it's a son or daughter grows up with a nuclear family with dad. But because dad is a workaholic or because dad right, right. has experienced something in his life, uh, it could be a traumatic life event. It has removed dad from the emotional and spiritual equation. And dad has become a figurehead that sits on the couch drinking beer all night. Yeah. And so that that dad being physically present but absent in any other way has almost the same effect negatively as the dad who's not there at all. And so, you know, 40% of kids in America right now are born out of wedlock. So instantly we've got... 40% of our children in America don't have a father in the home. Then you couple that with 50% of people are getting divorced. And you mm -hmm. figure, uh, and the, another statistic says that half of couples that get divorced, that father won't see his kid for an entire year. Wow. This fragmentation of the American family model has really dis decimated children. And so we have to come back to our men and say, listen, even if there's a divorce, you're still the father. You know, when you come home at night, you have to engage with your children. So we've just found, you know, calling men out of the bleachers, the anonymous bleachers and into the arena is what we're all about. And so you've got the absent, physically absent dad, and you've got the emotionally absent dad. Both of those guys, we need to bring them back into the game. Yeah. And so that's what we've committed to, to do. I feel like, or I don't feel like, I know this to be true, that most adult males can't define what it means to be a man. This is one of the, the challenges that we have working with um, military folks. You have these men who have worn the uniform. They've done very heroic things. Many of them, they've served in incredibly difficult situations. They've learned leadership in the best leadership schools in the world. And then they transition out of that role. They find themselves, you know, maybe out of the military or certainly in a home environment. They have a hard time relating to their kids, relating to their spouse. They can't hold down a job often outside of the military. They have a hard time interacting with other people. And they'll attribute that to trauma. Or they'll attribute that to, you know, culture at large. Culture doesn't understand me because I was in the military or whatever the case. Often it boils down to just you don't understand what it means to be a man. Now, to be a male, you got that figured out, right? But being a man is different than that. Uh, how do you define manhood and how do you communicate that to, because I know this is not a veteran problem. This is a, a male in America problem. How do you communicate that yeah. across the table? So this book behind, so I don't know if you knew this ahead of time, if you're setting me up, but this book right here, Strong Men, Dangerous Times. <laughs> I would never set you up. <laughs> <laughs> that book defines manhood. The whole purpose of that book is to take manhood, Great. you know, here's the, my, here's my assumption with men, whether they've served in the military or not, men need a hill to die on. Mm. They need a target to aim at, you know, it's this whole aim small, miss small concept. Yeah. We, we yeah. need to give men focus and a target. I've got a book. So this book here is like putting a, when I sight my rifles in, we used to go to down there in San Luis Bispo, we'd go down to the target range and we would, we'd bore sight that rifle. And then we would, once we had it bore sighted at 100 yards, we'd pull that we'd get it up to about the target. We put a paper target out there at about 25 yards, and yeah. we'd put the bullet on paper. You know, once we put the bullet on paper, then we would begin to get on the scope turret, and we would dial that in to have a great, uh, you know, a three shot half inch group. Let's say at a at 100 yards, right? And so we, but we had to put that on the paper. So this book. It puts manhood on the paper. I've got a book coming out in the fall called Dialed In, mm. which is which is a scope yeah. reference yeah. to really focus in even more. But this book identifies five areas that separate males from men. Wow. And when we put this book together, we wanted to make sure it was a book of truth, right? I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, so truth is very, very important to me. But a lot of times truth is not necessarily spiritual, right? Two plus two is four. It's four for everybody in the world. It's just yeah. four. It's always yeah. going to be four. 
a, a boy who has a, a person who has a penis is a male. A girl right. who's born with a thing, you know, is a female. You know, there are truths out there. So we wanted to have a definition of manhood that transcended uh, ethnicity. It transcended time. It transcended demographic. It transcended religion. And so we came up with five things, and it's like climbing a mountain. And so I define manhood as, as five things, and we can unpack it more if you want. But the trailhead of manhood is protecting integrity. The climb is fighting apathy. You mentioned apathy earlier. The summit, the apex of a, what a man can be is pursuing God passionately. And I don't care what a man believes. That is the truth. The downside or the descent of manhood is leading courageously and the, mm-hmm. the trail's end is finishing strong. And so it, it takes those five things to be a complete man. And so that's what we talk about in that book. And so, yeah, we used to call that book the man card, but I, the title just didn't, wasn't a, didn't, didn't fit right. So we changed it to strong men, in dangerous times, because we live in a day and age where it's dangerous to be a man Yeah, because right. everybody wants us to be uh, a male. They want us to comply with the cultural's culture's message. And it's just not true. There's a, there's a quote from Robert Lewis who wrote, um, he wrote a number of books, but stepping up the stepping up series, the men's fraternity yep. series, yep. but he, in that, he defines manhood as rejecting passivity, accepting responsibility, and leading courageously. And I, I love that. And, and I've often talked about manhood as you know being responsible, accepting responsibility. And you break that into five things, but really that's what it is. It's accepting responsibility. And, and kind of the enemy to all of that, again, you just mentioned this, is, is apathy. So a man can know what those five things are and understand what's needed to climb that hill. But we are so apathetic as men in the United States. What's, what's the reason for that? (laughs) And why is that so hard to push back on? I, I, you have men who would say something like this to their family, you know, I would die for you, uh, but I'm not going to go to my kids games. I'm not going to, you know, work hard to make sure they're doing the right thing. I'm not going to do this other stuff. It's just this this malaise, this apathy, this unwillingness to be responsible. Blame your wife for what's happening in the family. Blame your kids for their bad behavior. Blame your boss at work. Why is that such an issue that men have to address? Well, you know, so so uh, in 2007, I read Robert Lewis's book, Raising a Modern Day Night. Yeah, yeah, great and book. It was the first time I'd ever seen a guy define manhood, and he defined it as rejecting passivity, accepting responsibility, leading courageously and expecting a greater reward. That's right. So we we actually built our model off of that because I thought that passivity was not an end in itself. I thought the real problem was apathy. Yeah. And so we we changed ours. How do you define the difference there? What's the difference between the two? Yeah. So rejecting passivity is situational. I'm going to, Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at a situation and I'm going to choose to respond to it instead of ignore it. Apathy is, uh, is if I took my knife out and cut a callus away, apathy is the inability to feel mm. for something that a man should deeply care about. So mm. the man who the man, it's not about rejecting passivity. It's it's about feeling like if I see a little kid getting, you know, a violated by an adult. Right. To reject passivity would be to run at that and try to help that little child. But but what before that ever happens is is this thing that I have to feel something for that situation, right? So I have to cut away a callus because I can't tell you. I, I was at the airport picking up my wife, and there was a woman who had passed out. She I don't know if she was on drugs or not. She had collapsed in her car. She's laying next to her Land Rover, passed out. She's got a huge, huge knot on her head. She landed on the cement, hit the curb. And I was parked in a spot where there are 20 other cars with our lights shining right on her. Yeah. And as soon as I pulled up, I went and helped her because I was – I. I I want to be a man who feels deeply when people are hurting, but the 20 cars with me completely ignored this woman. Yeah. Yeah. And see, to me, that that is the difference, right? Apathy is going back. You're try- when you fight apathy, you're going one step further, and you're saying that it's a heart issue. We're rejecting passivity is more of a situational issue. Right. Right. For me personally, that's that's personally. Now, to go back to your question, you know, honestly – I, I tell guys PMS is the biggest problem we have in our society. PMS has ruined more marriages. PMS is the problem with all the things that we're talking about today. Uh, PMS is passive 
male syndrome. The guys go, oh, you had me. You had me, Ramos. You know, and it goes all the way back to the garden, man. I mean, when Adam went flat in the garden and allowed Eve to eat the fruit, the curse entered our world and men will be fighting passivity. They will be fighting apathy all of our lives. It's something that we will always battle because the this, this sin that has entered the world has created a default setting for men, but that's yeah. not a kingdom concept. The kingdom concept that God had before the fall was to protect Eve and to guard the garden. You know, when God made Adam, he made him outside in the wilderness and he put him in the garden. Mm. And when he made Eve, he made her in the garden. So the women are used to that security and we're wild men that God has put us in this situation. He said, Hey, I want you to be wild. Yeah. And so we've, we've, lost that in the fall but it's not god's intention yeah man there's so much wrapped up in that i i yeah. hear guys say all right well you know i get that you know with dealing with apathy or um standing up and doing the right thing but i work i do this i do that i need balance in my life and i know you talk about balance and uh, I was asked about this not too long ago on a podcast how do you define balance and we worked all the way through that but in light of men, you know, we're wild men, right? We're supposed to protect. We're supposed to do these things. We need to go through this process of uh, moving forward and moving uh, really up that mountain and, and being the men God created us to be. How do you deal with that? this idea? It's kind of a cultural idea of balance in our lives. And I think a lot of men would say, well, I need my time. I need my thing. I've got to be balanced in my life. How do you address that? You know, it's really interesting. There's it's there's two arguments to that that question. You know, in Luke 2:52, the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So he grew spiritually, physically, mentally, and um, socially. Right. So there is a balance. But you know, here's the deal: Jesus was never married, never had a family. Yeah. So when we look at a man who is, are we target men in the stress bubble, right? You target active mili you know, military uh, personnel. So yep. let's say I come back from a deployment and now I'm, I'm dealing with a traumatic life event and I'm now raising a family with my wife and I've got children in the home. I've got a mortgage. I've got 2.5 dogs or whatever. And they're, so they're in this stress bubble, right? Yeah. And so life in the stress bubble is really not balanced. <laughs> it is yeah. completely yeah. out of balance. I yeah. mean, when I raise my kids in the stress bubble, uh, it was a completely out of balance situation. So I had to default back to, you know, who am I as a follower of Jesus? And what does the Bible say? Who am I as a man? And what is the, what are my values? And so for me, the value, one of my, va my main values right behind my relationship with God is my wife. You know, she is a priority. Biblically speaking, she takes priority over my children. And she mm -hmm. always has. Yep. That and men need to realize that if you want to live biblically, whether it's your first, second, or third marriage, your wife is number one and your kids are number two. If you're going to take a bullet, you take it for the wife before the kids. And so, guys have to address that issue. And then, the next thing is, man, at my funeral, the people who will be weeping at my funeral will either be weeping with regret or weeping because they uh, will miss me. And they will not be my co-workers. They will be my children and my wife and my grandchildren. And so I think a lot of times we as guys are so conquer focused. We're so, um, you know, we're so, uh, so driven in our careers. We forget that the people who will weep over us will not be our co-workers. You know, we think that if we, you know, we'll be remembered for what we did from nine to five. And yeah. the truth is, will really be remembered from what we did between five and nine at night. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, I, uh, <laughs> I struggle with how to communicate this sometimes to people outside of the church. I have no idea how men who don't believe in that absolute truth of the Bible can, can establish priorities like that. It, it, it's, <clears throat> I mean, this is a conversation I know you, you have. We have it often is until you first accept that there is truth, that God gave that to us, that he is our priority, the rest of it won't fall into line. You have to start there in order for any of this to make sense. That is so good, man. I'm so, so I have a man, I have a, I have what I call my man theology. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's, you know, and it, it really started off 
in a conversation I had with a relative who's not a Christian. And, you know, here's my man theology. So most guys who we talk to, most people in humanity will agree that there is some kind of higher power out there. Sure, sure. There's some, there's some creator, something happened. You know, even people that believe in evolution aren't stupid enough to believe that it wasn't guided, at least, by some higher power. Yeah. So if there really is some creator out there, which I say this to guys all the time, do you believe in God? And they say yes. My next question is, well, God, you know, any creator who creates something creates it for to 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 have some kind of purpose for that thing. Right. 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 So do you believe that God has made you with a purpose? Well, yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, if God if there is a God and God made you for a purpose, it makes sense that if he created you and made you for a purpose, that he has some kind of love towards you because who creates something and doesn't feel something towards that? Do you believe that? Yes. Well, then the next thing is if, if God made you, if God loves you, if God has a purpose for you, how will you, you know, and he, he, he wants to have some kind of interaction or relationship with you. How, how will you ever become the version that you've been created to be without radical, radical devotion to that God that made you? And they scratch their heads because logically nothing lines up. Once you realize that nothing lines up logically, the only logical solution is you have to give your life to this creator in order to be the full, the fully alive, fully engaged, fully potentialed yeah. out man. And once they see that, they go, wow, that I never looked at it that way. And yeah. so and if we don't do that, then our values are all over the table. Right. We have no priority structure. We have no value system. We have no moral absolutes, you know, uh, you know, and it, it gets crazy and our world has gotten a little crazy. Because we've allowed some of these um, insane ideals to creep in. You know, in Oregon, state law in Oregon now requires tampons to be in the guys' bathrooms. <laughs> I, what, what is sure this? It does. Sure it's it does. insanity. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and that's, you know, when I think about this, I, I look at people who are not people of faith, who don't, you know, ascribe to what I believe about the Bible and God. And... I can't fault them for doing what they do, for working a job to make as much money as possible, for going home and, you know, drinking beer and playing video games and, you know, watching porn and doing the things that they do that I would criticize and say are unhealthy and take you to an end that you will someday regret. You're leaving no kind of a legacy. But without the absolute truth of Scripture, what else are they going to do? There, There is nothing else. And you have to frame it within the context of, of what God, your creator, has designed you to do. Um, and, and that's that's where the power, I think, in, in you know, what you do and in what we do, that's where it comes from. It's not a new idea. It's just understanding God has a real plan for you and we need to get a hold of that. And that changes everything. It changes everything. Well, you know, it's funny, man. I, I just go back to my 23 year old self because at 23, I was not living for the Lord. Yeah. And I remember we my football, I, I played football and I had five roommates and we would literally like like five nights a week, we would watch porn, drink beer, sure. masturbate, bring girls in, parade them around, you know, do whatever we could. We would do whatever they would let us do to them, you know, and, and, you know, we celebrated that stuff. I mean, we high five, we celebrated it. But we, when I became a follower of Jesus and realized that that stuff was damaging, not only to my life, but my family's, my future family and my bride, mm -hmm. I repented of those things, right? Yeah. I waited three years. Yeah. I, I met my wife. I didn't touch a woman for three years. My wife and I never had sex until our wedding night. I mean, I re I went all in on this thing yeah. because the things I realized, the things I once celebrated because I had no rules. It was kind of do whatever you want were the things I now was ashamed of and fought to have victory over. Right. So you're right. I mean, if I, I mean, if I don't believe in Jesus, Hey, buddy, it's a free for all. And I'm yeah. going to send pictures of it all, baby, because it's yeah. Li yeah. eat, drink, be merry, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a right. Road. And, and so, you know, kind of the last of your five points, that finishing strong, you don't finish strong without Jesus. <laughs> um, and yet there are so many people that finishing strong means, you know, having the most stuff and the most influence and the most whatever. And it is a dead end. How do you talk about finishing strong? I I'll say this first probably the most influential book in my life when I was in my late twenties was a book called finishing strong by Steve Farrar. I've got and it. A, a family member handed it to me 
and said, you need to read this because you have, you know, young kids and you have a, you know, a young wife and you need to figure this stuff out. And it didn't have the same impact on me when I read it the first time as it did 10 years later and then being involved in ministry. But man, again, how you define that is so important. How do you talk about finishing strong? What does that look like? Well, you know, it's, it's really funny because I'm passionate about that because uh, several, when I was a 13 years old, my mother and I went in and bought my stepdad a Remington Model 700, mm. 270 for his Christmas present. And he was, a, he was a stepdad of mine for 33 years. He was a great stepdad. I really liked him a lot. And then in December of 2012, he took that same gun, put it under his chin and, and blew his head off. And I know that that you guys deal with a lot of yeah. that in the military with 22 yeah. of our uh, heroes, you know, daily taking their lives. And so, you know, he left the world with a question mark. Yeah. And so when we when we go out and we don't finish our life strong, you know, we leave a lot of questions behind. I've got a I'm going to lunch right after this with a young man, 21 year old man, just found his mother died of a drug overdose. And he's really struggling with a lot of questions. And so what happens when we don't finish strong, we 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 leave a lot of questions. But, you know, in John 1930, I've got a couple of pet peeves spiritually. I'm sure you do, too. One of mine is. (laughs) <laughs> One of mine is, man, if there is not an exclamation mark on John 1930, I write it in myself or I don't read that Bible. And it's Jesus on the cross screaming in a war cry that would have made William Wallace pee his pants. It is finished. Mm. And to me, that's how Jesus yeah. went out. It doesn't change theologically how he went out with a war cry or a whimper. But to me, yeah. and I can prove it scripturally, I can prove that he went out with a war cry. But for me, that makes all the difference in the world. So for me, my end game, right? I'm a man, my target, my goal in life, I want to go out like Jesus. I want to go out with a war cry. I want to go out with an exclamation mark. And so when I die, I want to leave no doubt in anybody's life who I was, who I lived for, and that now the baton is passed to them. So that being said, that being said, I thought, okay, how do I do that? It's really fine to have an end game, but life is hard. You know, life is about suffering. It's about embracing the suck of life that we live in, right? And so for me, I realized, okay, it's not how I start the day that matters. There's a lot of podcasts. Everybody wants to talk about how you start your day. What are the first right. five things you do? And I have my first five things I do. But but really, that's not the we, – we miss the boat on that. What really matters for a man in the bubble, in the arena, is how do you end your day? Like, what are the first three things you do at the end of your day? And so what I tell guys is whatever you put to the grindstone will be remembered at your tombstone. So when you get home from work, it is time for you to become the family man and the father you've been called to be. And I've got to, it's really funny. I get a lot of blue collar guys go, hey, man, I work hard. You're a pencil pusher. Like That can't be done. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, bro, but you're like some gnarly blue collar guy with calluses. You can't handle holding your kids and kissing your wife. Yeah. So that I don't I don't buy that excuse or or I get this one. Well, I work swing shift. OK, great. Then you better be the greatest dad in the mornings that have ever been invented yeah. Yeah. To, to 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 make an excuse to not pour yourself into the family that God has called you to is the weakest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'll never buy into it. So so I really encourage guys to finish every day strong. Compounded over time equals a life that is finished strong, finish strong, finishes don't just happen. They happen because they're compounded over time, right? You're, you're, you know, this whole, you know, in the military SOPs, what are SOPs for? SOPs are so that when you get into the battle, you have memory and you're, right. you're going through it because right. it's already been ingrained in you. And so that's why these habits are so important for men that they will, sh- you know, I tell men, you need to show up until it's boring. Tell your kids you love them till it's boring. I mean, just show up so often that they're bored of seeing you. You're just always the guy there. Yeah. Once you get to that point, you have a compounding effect. That's awesome. Man, that's so good. I uh, I just finished a, a challenge. So around Veterans Day, we always do something for our organization. And um, it's kind of a long story. But this year, I decided to do a marathon a day for 22 days, talking about veteran suicide and all of these issues. So. Whoa. Yeah. So October 21st, I did my first one and I did a marathon a day until Veterans Day, November 11th, which, you know, as we're recording just passed. And so I, it was a crazy thing. And I could talk about that experience all day long, but that's I have a, awesome. I have a friend who texted me. 
I, at like day 12 or something, right? And so I'm getting encouraging texts from people like, hey, good job, keep going, this motivating, whatever. He texted me and he goes, hey, man, love you. Uh, just want to remind you, nobody cares how you start, you better finish, right? That's what people will remember. And I'm in the middle of this like just overwhelming thing, right? And he's like, hey, oh, yeah. just, just a reminder, you better finish this thing. And uh, I kind of laughed when I got it and, and it was it was motivating and it was helpful. But man, that is absolutely the truth. There's so much fanfare when you start. It's easy to start, but it's that finishing that makes all the difference. And that's how you'll be remembered. And that's the influence you'll leave on your families. And um, that's that's the whole thing. And if you if you live with that in your mind, it changes your day to day, right? Uh, how, how am I going to end? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny, man. So we do a physical challenges too. And one of them we did two years ago. I finished the challenge for this year already. But last year's challenge was 65,000 push-ups, which really wow. isn't as hard as it sounds. It's 200 sounds like a lot. Well, it's, you know, push-ups aren't hard, you know. Yeah. You know, once you get in the rhythm. So it's 255 days a week. And so we jumped on board. We threw it out there. We had 491 men sign cool. up. 491. Yeah. yeah. By December 31st, we had 41 guys that got the T-shirt. Mm. One of them was a 12-year-old autistic kid whose dad tapped out on the first day. Another <laughs> one was a paraly guy who got in an uh, accident was paralyzed from his waist down. Another guy got in a car wreck, and was his doctor said he'd never do a push-up again because of his wrist. I had to get a shoulder injection, but I realized what I realized in all of this was that strong finishes are not accomplished by the ones with the most skill. Right. That's They're right. accomplished That's right. with the ones with the most grit. That's exactly right. And so there's got to be this element of grit. And, 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 I, and I think for me, it's this, I look at my marriage, you know, people say, well, how have you been married 31 years to one woman? I said, well, Jesus and stubbornness, not in that order, <laughs> not in that order. Right. So, right. You know, I think once we begin to like for you running your marathons, which by the way, that is, we got to talk about that when you're on my show, sure. that is so freaking <laughs> epic. But, but what, what happened for you probably is you you took negotiations off the table. There right. were no no no. You were going to finish or die. Right. And in the military, what do you guys call that? Death ground, right? Cortez yeah. created death ground. You get into a death ground situation where there you either fight or you die. There is no turning back. And so so that is critical for us as guys. I am going to do. I am going to show up, and it's there's no negotiations on the table. Yeah, that's so good. I was going to ask you, what is your principle for moving forward when life is overwhelming, right? That's kind of what I talk about on this show often, but, but I think that's it. <laughs> it. You take negotiations off the table. Yeah, for me, that's it for sure. You know, um, w w divorce has never been an option. Yeah. So I had to make a decision. Yeah. In fact, I know you have a, a, a facility in Paso. I was in a Tascadero one day yeah. pounding the steering wheel of my car going, I hate my wife. God, take her out, kill her, <laughs> nuke her cancer. I don't care. I hate her. And I, I had this, I came to this realization, wow, I'm going to spend the next 70 years of my life with a woman I hate, or I can turn it around Yeah. because yeah. divorce is not on the table. That's right. And so yeah. I think that's a critical thing for, for me moving forward. Like my ministry, we've had so many times where there's no money, our house is in foreclosure. You know, I started with the white letters, then you get the yellow letters, then you get the pink letters, then you get the phone call from the Indian guy, then sure. you get the phone call from the Hispanic woman, and they're all saying the same thing. It just, but, but, you know, we, we realize we are going to either succeed in ministry or we are going to die trying. That's it. And I think for me, that's been the, the, the one attribute of my life that I have that many don't have in this world. And it's the ability to beat the dead horse to take negotiation off the table and just to say, I'm going to do what I've been called to do. And if I die, I die. But that's really the only option on the table. Man, Jim, that's so good. There's so much here. We could probably do a series of podcasts, which you do. So, but we could do a series of podcasts on all of these. Um, tell us where people can find uh, your ministry, your podcast, your books, all of the stuff that you're involved in. Yeah, we're all over social media uh, at, and it's at, at, men in the arena or at the men in the arena. It depends on the platform, but the best place to find us, man, is, is men in the arena.org. And you can kind of get everything from right there. That's good. Jim Ramos. Thank you so much, man. This was awesome. And, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk again for sure, but, uh, really appreciate what you guys are doing. Just keep up the good work. We need it.
I appreciate Jim and the clarity with which he understands this issue and communicates this, this issue. Please go and check out his work and uh, the incredible ministry that he has at Men in the Arena. Uh, you can find that on the social, uh, all the social platforms, of course, but you can go to their website and see all that they're involved in, find material, listen to the podcast. That would be fantastic. And I hope uh, that Jim and I are able to have another conversation in the future. I think we probably will. Uh, for those of you listening again, thank you for joining in. I appreciate it. If you're watching, thank you for watching and, and take time. If you haven't yet to subscribe, very important. You subscribe to this podcast that helps me and that helps you. And that would be fantastic. Take some time as well. Jump over to life audio, lifeaudio.com. That is the platform for the podcast. And uh, I'd encourage you to check out the other great podcasts that are found there. Thank you so much again for joining. Look forward to talking to you next time. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org.